is Tia Mitchell, Washington, <laughs> Washington correspondent at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and the Reverend Al Sharpton, host of Politics Nation, founder and president of the National Action Network and author of Righteous Troublemakers, Untold Stories of the Social Justice Movement in America. Thank you both very much for coming to The Sunday Show. My apologies for, for chuckling there. Um, but you got to laugh to keep from crying, Rev. I just, what does it tell us that Republicans tried? Well, first, let's just talk about the early voting. What does it mean that they tried so hard to block early voting from starting yesterday? Well, I think clearly it means that they are not confident they could win. If they thought they were in a winning position, they'd be saying, let's go with early voting, even if you want to extend it to an earlier day than, than Saturday. Uh, so I think it's a real indication that their internal polling is telling them they cannot win this. I also think that the selection of uh, Herschel Walker is really offensive to American people because what they're saying is that we're going to allow Donald Trump to intimidate us into putting any black up because it's an in incumbent black uh, that is there who's clearly qualified, who's clearly delivered in Georgia. We'll just get anybody. We're not going to vet them. We're not going to interview them. I mean, th they had no preparation for this guy. He's just a black, throw him out there. And we ought to be offended by it. And Herschel ought to be embarrassed. You know, Tia, a new, uh, a new poll by the AARP shows that the race still remains close between Warnock and, and Walker at 51, 40, 47 percent, respectively. Uh, but it also notes that Warnock has a lead with independent voters, bringing in about 54 percent compared to Walker's 39 percent. Why is that shift so important? That shift is really important because, as you've been noting, this election is going to be all about turnout. And this election is going to be close. So those independent voters who in Georgia can swing an election, it's notable that it looks like a majority of them are going towards Warnock. That bodes well for his ability to win in a runoff that is expected to be close, because we know both candidates are going to have their base. It's who can speak to those in the middle that are able to swing the election. Mm -hmm. You know, Rev, now this gets to um, why I was chuckling after that intro, because Herschel Walker has been criticized for seeming to have handlers in all of his interviews of late, but the outrageous comments keep coming. What do you make of this strategy, if you want to call it that, of flanking Herschel Walker with Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham that you, and, and Tim Scott you see all there on the screen? You cannot flank someone if they are not worthy of being flanked. Uh, it's one thing to have a candidate that may be average and you need to bolster them. It's another that is totally inept and incompetent, and you're trying to hold up somebody that has no legs. You know, even with training wheels, you do need a bicycle. And I think that uh, there are uh, training wheels with no bicycle. There's no bad there politically. Hershey was a great athlete. I'm sure he may be uh, good in other things. But there is no there there when it comes to policy, when it comes to legislation, and when it comes to just basic politics. Herschel Walker doesn't have a clue, and it was a disservice for Donald Trump to impose him upon the Georgia State Republican Party. I think that many of the people that I relate to in Georgia, we have an office there in Atlanta, National Action Network, were inclined to support uh, Reverend Warnock anyway. But... They at least wanted to have a fair fight and a competitive fight. That is not the case. The people that are supporting Warnock are supporting putting a Republican in that seat. It has nothing to do with uh, Herschel Walker. You know, T, let me get your reaction um, to something or get you tell me the reaction in Georgia to this story. There's um, well, Herschel Walker has been a part of multiple scandals, but the latest one is a documents of surface that suggests that um, Herschel Walker Still, he, Texas is his primary residence. How's that going over in Georgia, if at all? So I think that, again, there are voters that we've been talking to throughout this campaign that say, we don't care. 
We are with Herschel Walker no matter what. The controversies haven't swayed them. To them, it's important to get a Republican in that seat. It, to them, it's important to try to blunt President Biden's ability to carry out his agenda. Um, of course, Democrats are, they say it's yet another controversy. The question is, are the voters, again, those voters who can swing a vote, those moderate voters, those voters that split their ticket and voted for Kemp and Warnock in the general election, the question is, does this matter enough to them to make them want to vote for Senator Warnock? That's where controversies like these continue to possibly drag down Herschel Walker's ability to win the race. And I'm wondering, is there any lack of enthusiasm among Republican voters? Sure, Republicans want the seat, no matter who the Republican nominee is. But um, since this isn't going to decide the, the majority in the Senate, any signs that Republican enthusiasm writ large has diminished? Well, I'll say this. I'll say that there was always an enthusiasm gap among Republicans about their candidate. There were a lot of Republicans who said, you know, Herschel Walker isn't necessarily my choice, but it's the candidate we have. What Republicans are trying to do now is to make this race about President Biden, about giving Republicans a seat. It's not about Herschel Walker. When we see Governor Kemp and other Republicans campaigning on Herschel Walker's behalf, that's the message that they send. They don't focus on the candidate them, himself. Mm -hmm. They focus on what's at stake with the race and saying, as, as Republicans, we need you to support him to help us achieve our goals in Washington. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rev, in the time that we have left, i got to talk to you about this Mar-a-Lago dinner um, that, that Donald Trump had with the artist formerly known as Kanye West and Nick Fuentes, who the Justice Department has labeled as a, as a white supremacist. Uh, one advisor to Trump called it a bleeping nightmare, while Trump tried to uh, claim ignorance. I mean, you and I just, uh, you know, I interviewed you for a column about the documentary on you called Loudmouth. And one of the interesting co conversations you and I had was how you juxtaposed the racism and taunts that you endured while marching through the white neighborhoods of Bensonhurst and, and Howard Beach back in the 80s, how that informs how we should look at Donald Trump today. Talk more about that and fold in this Nick Fuentes dinner into that. Yeah, Donald Trump uh, was born and raised in Queens, New York. And if you see this documentary is coming out week after next in theaters, uh, it shows the actual footage of when we would march in Queens for killing a, a black a young man for just being in a neighborhood. They would come out and openly, on camera, looking at TV cameras, mm -hmm. call us the N-word and throw watermelons at us. And they show the actual footage in the documentary. And that's the Queens Donald Trump grew up on. Donald Trump grew up in a climate of Northern racism. You know, people think racism and racial bigotry was only displayed and exercised in the South. And one of the reasons I'm glad John Legend and them did this documentary on me is it shows the footage. These are not actors. The actual things that happened. Donald Trump only took a position on one racial case that I know of in all of the years that I've been out here, and he's been out here, and he's nine years older than me. And that was in Central Park, Jogger case, where he took full-page ads calling for the death penalty of five black and brown young men accused of raping a white woman. And he called for them to get the death penalty, and when they were exonerated, he wouldn't take it back. So it is in that climate that he meets with this white supremacist. He comes out of that. His father and him were sued in the 80s for mm -hmm. racial discrimination in Queens. But let me tell you where this becomes nonsensical, uh, uh, Jonathan and Tia. Donald Trump is a former president. He still has Secret Service. The Secret Service screens who visits a former president. When I've been around Barack Obama since he left the White House, you have to say who you're bringing. Are you saying that this man's running for president again and doesn't screen who he allows to come to the dinner table? That is against all protocol of Secret Service. For nothing other than security, they know who's coming. He knew who he was meeting with. He knew the background. And now he's trying to, in many ways, do the Michael Jackson moonwalk when it does not apply. He has Secret Service. Are they saying Secret Service did not have a list of who was coming to dinner? 
I don't believe that. 